Part 8 And I said nothing. The signs of compliance on Nazis, rape culture and terrorism. As Hitler rose to power, he had many supporters. Among them was an outspoken protestant anti-Smite called Pastor Martin Nimola. Over time, however, Nimola realized the harm that Hitler was causing and in 1933 became part of an opposition group made of clergy members, the Fire Not Bund, Pastors Emergency League. For this, Nimola was eventually arrested and sent to two different concentration camps, which against the odds, he survived. After the war, he spoke openly about the people's complicity in the Holocaust. It was during this time that he wrote one of the most recognizable protest poems, An Ode to Dangers of Political Apathy. Note that the history of the exact text of this poem is complicated with Nimola never writing down a definitive version and naming different groups depending on who he was speaking to. But this is one, possibly tweaked version. First, they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out, because I wasn't a socialist. Then, they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out, because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out, because I wasn't a Jew. Then, they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. It is a poignant statement. To me, it reveals how dangerous it is to perceive society's problems as someone else's problem. It speaks to the complicity that comes with doing nothing, and it makes us wonder why we so often do nothing when others around us are suffering. We might respond to hypothetical ethical dilemmas with our morality blazing. We might think that if a violent xenophobic leader were to step into power, we would hold our ground that we could never be involved in the systemic oppression of Jews or Muslims or women or of other minorities, that we wouldn't let history repeat itself. A million accomplices. But both history and science call this into question. In 2016, after breaking a 66-year vow of silence, Joseph Goebbels, 105-year-old former secretary, said, Those people, nowadays, who say that they would have stood up against the Nazis, I believe they are sincere in meaning that, but believe me, most of them wouldn't have. Joseph Goebbels was the Minister of Propaganda for the Third Reich until Hitler, contributing hugely to Nazi war efforts. He facilitated actions that are almost universally considered evil, and when it became clear that World War II was lost, he committed suicide with his wife after poisoning their six children with cyanide. Horrific acts carried out by ideologically driven people were one thing, but the complicity of normal Germans in the Holocaust seemed beyond anyone's understanding. In an attempt to understand, scientists examined how it could be possible to lead an entire population into horror. The famous Milgram experiments, which I have already discussed in Chapter 3, were motivated by the 1961 trial of one of the organizers of the final solution, Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann, who famously argued that he was just following orders when he sent Jews to their deaths as other senior Nazis had pleaded in the Nuremberg trials several years earlier. Could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? Mergram asked, could we call them all accomplices? Who were the million accomplices? Were there really just one million? When we discuss the complexity of Nazi Germany, we must tease apart different kinds of behaviors that were needed to allow for such atrocities to occur. Bystanders made up the largest number of those who allowed the Holocaust to happen. Those who didn't believe in the ideology and were not involved in the Nazi party, but witnessed or knew about the atrocities and didn't intervene. These bystanders were not just in Germany, but around the world. Then, there were those who believed the rhetoric who believed that they were helping to improve the world with ethnic cleansing and with beliefs like that and actions were in alignment. Finally, we had those who didn't believe in the Nazi ideology but felt they had no choice but to join the party or believed that joining would give them personal benefits. Some of these individuals who behaved in ways not in line with their beliefs were following orders to kill others but many were involved behind the scenes of Nazi Germany as administrators, propaganda authors, or in general political activity, rather than in the direct killing of individuals. Of all these, Milgram was most interested in the latter, 
wanting to understand how ordinary citizens could inflict harm on another person simply because he was ordered to. To briefly retrace the method that I described in chapter 3, participants in these studies were told to administer shocks to a person they believed to be a second participant in another room, increasing in severity until they believed they had killed them. The Milgram experiments are perhaps a tired mainstay of popular psychology books, but they are included here because they profoundly changed the way scientists and large parts of the wider population viewed the human capacity for compliance. These experiments and their modern replications show the profound influence that authority figures can have over us, but the studies are not without criticism. They have been criticized both for being too realistic and for not being realistic enough. On the one hand, some participants may have been traumatized by the realism believing themselves to have killed someone. On the other, some participants might have guessed that the pain was fake given that they were participating in an experiment and might have gone further than they would in real life. To deal with these issues, researchers have repeatedly tried to partially replicate the Milgram studies and succeeded. Every time, getting similar results in compliance as in the original study. If you think that today we would have learned from this and would be better able to resist dangerous instructions, you are unfortunately wrong. According to the neuroscientist Patrick Haggard, who partially replicated the coercive elements of the Milgram study in 2015, people who were instructed to do so were more likely to actually not just pretend to shook another participant, our results suggest people who obey orders could actually feel less responsible for the outcomes of their action. They may not just be claiming that they feel less responsible, people appear to experience a sort of distance from the outcome of their actions when they are obeying instructions. Understanding humans' seemingly bound disobedience to authority and compliance may help explain large-scale devastation but should never excuse it. We must be careful to not outsource our morality, and we must stand up against authority that is instructing us or encourages us to do things that seem inappropriate. Next time you are instructed to do something that seems wrong, think about what it is you are about to do and consider whether you would have thought it appropriate had you not been ordered to do so. Similarly, Whenever you realize that you are compliant with a culture that severely disadvantages a select group of people, speak up and resist the urge to do what everyone else is doing. But let us return to compliance. Because such experiences seem abstract, I want to discuss a different kind of compliance. A compliance with the systemic oppression of an entire group of people. People who are not given the same rights, the same respect, the same pay. It's time to talk about the devastating effects of being complicit with misogyny. Rape culture. Unlike the various sexual deviances, fetishes, and sexual fantasies we covered earlier, those of us who commit sexual assault don't have a paraphilia. We don't make low comments, group or rape others, and commit the large number of other sexual assaults because we are only or primarily aroused by doing so. No. Sexual assault happens at least in part because some of us harbor fundamental views shared by much of our society that makes it seem like acceptable, understandable, or at least tolerable behavior. We, as society, perpetuate a set of misogynistic values that have such vicious roots they only can do harm. All of us help make men into sexual predators. We are all to blame, some more than others. How? It begins with the little things. The everyday sexism that creates a pervasive culture of objectification, harassment, and sexual assault. Women and men both engage in a series of behaviors that makes the poor treatment of women seem okay. Like when we tell a woman first that she is attractive, then that she's interesting or intelligent. When we laugh at the banter at work that implies that Susie is a slut or Amanda is a bitch. When we get angry if a woman doesn't want to sleep with us and call her a tease. When we assume that women don't want sex, so men need to coax them into it. When we are annoyed that a woman has put us into the friend zone. And when we assume that buying dinner or a drink or a present means we are entitled to sex. But how can all this lead to rape? Society teaches men that makeup on our faces is for them, that the clothes we wear are for them, that our bodies are for them. 
Often referred to as rape myth, such beliefs can be precursors to sexual assault and they have been extensively studied. In 2011, Sarah Macon and Lawrence Farmer created a rape myth acceptance scale which included both overt and subtle rape myth. According to them, the main categories of rape myth are that 1. The victim asked for it 2. The perpetrator didn't mean to 3. It wasn't really rape and 4. The victim lied All of these seek to excuse the behavior of rapists and place at least some of the blame for the behavior on the victim. One of my favorite illustrations of the perceivedness of the rape mess in society comes in the form of a study by Miranda Horvath in 2011. She wanted to see whether lads magazines, magazines targeting young men, are normalizing extreme sexist views by presenting those views in a mainstream context. As part of this research, they gave participants quotes from lads mags and quotes from interviews with convicted rapists. They wanted to see whether the participants could tell the difference between them and how acceptable they would find the quotes. Actually, let's test this. It's time for a game of lads mag or rapist. 1. You don't want to be caught red-handed. Go and smash her on a park bench. That used to be my trick. 2. What burns me up sometimes about girls is dick teasers. They lead a man on and then shut him off right there. 3. Girls ask for it by wearing these mini skirts and hot pants. They are just displaying their body, whether they realize it or not, they are saying, Hey, I've got a beautiful body and it's yours if you want it. 4. Mascara running down the cheeks mean they have just been crying and it was probably your fault, but you can cheer up the miserable beauty with a bit of the old in and out. Can you tell the difference? Participants scored only slightly above chance, guessing that it was a lad's mag correctly 56.1% of the time and that it was a convicted rapist 55.4% of the time. And here's my favorite or least favorite part. According to the authors, the participants ranked the quotes drawn from lads magazines to be more degrading to women than the quotes drawn from convicted rapists. That's right. The beliefs echoed in actual print magazines were overall seen to be worse than the beliefs shared by actual rapists. The authors argue that this suggests that framing such content within lads mags may normalize it for young men. Oh, and one in four were from lads mags, while two and three were from rapists. A follow-up study by Peter Hegarty and colleagues was published in 2018. They found that the issue was a bit more complicated. Participants now found sexist quotes off-putting and hostile. They also found that there was a shift away from magazines that promote such beliefs, at least in the UK. Still, they conclude by saying that the research has implications beyond magazines, that it could be used to change the lad culture that normalizes talk of sexual violence. Ladishness may be less prevalent on supermarket shelves than a few years ago, but remains relevant on campuses, on and offline. Our findings may be useful in applied attempts to engender critical thinking among young men in such contexts, where equal treatment of women is a social norm, but sexism remains relevant to young men's sexual socialization. Sexism in many countries feels like it's a thing of the past. This is perhaps one of many reasons why we are reluctant to accept stories of sexual offending, because we don't do things like this. We are progressive. We may openly disparage comments like those from the rapists or lads mags, but when any conversation turns to someone reporting sexual harassment or sexual assault, often someone will say, A. The victim's lying, B. They are exaggerating, or C. They are trying to ruin the perpetrator's life. How could she do this to him? Rape myths are unfortunately still alive and well. Do we possibly endorse rape myth because victim blaming is in line with our just world belief? In other words, the belief that this won't happen to us, or our wives, or our daughters, that sexual assault only happens to sluts who get drunk and hang out in back lies, that if we don't hang out in back lies and dress conservatively and don't get drunk, then we won't get assaulted. So, how common is sexual assault really? Looking at official crime statistics doesn't particularly help us with this question because even for the most extreme forms of sexual assault, including rape, most crimes are never reported. The personal threshold for reporting is exceptionally high for most people and what exactly these thresholds entail 
differs for everyone. Some may be prepared to come forward after being grouped, and while others may only come forward after being raped repeatedly. Even for things that meet the threshold fear of negative consequences for oneself or the perpetrator, self-blame and cultural factors often hold back victim disclosure. Even defining sexual assault is difficult. Consequently, answering the question, how many people have been sexually assaulted, is essentially impossible, but it is presumed that the unreported dark figure is huge. This is further complicated because focusing on a prevalence number implies that there is a clear distinction between sexual assault, which is often assumed to be traumatic, devastating and life-changing, and other experiences, which are often assumed to be trivial or acceptable and are left unexamined. Indeed, whether someone sexually touched woman's bum or raped her generally falls within the same category of sexual assault. Although most of us would agree, and the law says, that these are different crimes. Still, in an effort to get at least a sense of the extent of the problem, researchers often rely on self-report measures and try to come up with simplified numbers that are easy to talk about. For example, according to a review of the self-report literature in 2017 by Charlene, Merlhard and colleagues, approximately one in five women are sexually assaulted during their four years at American colleges. We know quite a bit about sexual assault on campus, mostly because this is a population to which researchers have comparatively easy access. Colleagues and Wellenheim, however, argue that this rate is the same for high school students and for non-students of the same age, although others have suggested that the rate for the latter is higher, at 25% for women not in college. And sexual assault is not just limited to young women. According to a 2017 meta-analysis by Yoon ji and colleagues, examining the self-reported extent of abuse against women aged 60 plus around the world, they found that on average 2.2% of older adults are sexually assaulted every year. Ask any woman, and you'll find many accounts of unwanted sexual touching or even rape. It's an epidemic, and we are always looking for people to blame, people who don't include ourselves. This was echoed in a court case in England in March 2017 by Judge Lindsay Kushner QC, who was sentencing a rapist. Girls are perfectly entitled to drink themselves into the ground, but should be aware of people who are potential defendants to rape gravitate towards girls who have been drinking. On first glance, this statement seems benevolent, but then we see what I think to be the glimmer of victim blaming. She is essentially suggesting that if women just didn't drink so much, they wouldn't get raped so often. She also didn't do herself any favors when she made the following analogy. How I see it's burglars are out there and nobody says burglars are okay, but we do say please don't leave your back door open at night, take steps to protect yourselves. This shows us that even those who, like Lindsay Kushner, spend much of their careers helping rape victims and sensing rapists to death, endorse rape myth. They are so pervasive that they seep into all the eclans of our society. Endorsing rape myth gives us an illusion of control. The sort of being raped is terrifying, so we cling to the illusion of being able to prevent it, even if it ends up hurting us in the long run, and makes it less likely that we are going to address the real causes of rape because we are wasting our time assessing the length of women's skirts. But are those who sexually assault evil, they are certainly often portrayed as such. Unfortunately, from the cases we do know about, sexual assault is so prevalent that if we were to send all the perpetrators to a remote island, we would see our population shrink dramatically. Those who sexually assault others are mostly normal people, our brothers, fathers, sons, friends and partners, yet their actions cannot be excused because of the pervasiveness of the rape myth. So what can we do? I believe that better sexual socialization is one key to preventing rape. We need to call our sexism, rape myth and bad behavior every time we see it. Luckily, it seems that with initiatives like hashtag MeToo encouraging women to talk about sexual harassment, we are finally having a conversation about the seemingly little things that together normalize a culture of violence towards women. A revolution is underway, and it's long overdue. We need all the daughters and sons, sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers in this together. 
we need for possibly the first time in history to treat the women of the world as capable, complex, fully formed human beings who are not inferior to men. Killing Katie. Let's stick with the idea of being complicit with bad behavior rather than being active agents for a moment. What would you do if you saw someone at the top of a bridge about to jump, or standing on the ledge of a skyscraper, running in front of a train? I bet you would think you would help. Try to talk them out of it. The way we respond to social displays of violence, real or threatened, tells us a lot about humanity. In 2015, anthropologist Frances Larson gave a talk where she chronicled the development of public acts of violence focusing mostly on public beheadings. She talked about how public beheadings by the government or more recently by terrorist groups have long been a public spectacle. And although it might seem that like the viewer plays a passive role when they watch such an event, they mistakenly feel that they are absolved from responsibility. We may feel disengaged, but we are giving a violent act the desired attention. Much as a theatre piece falls to have the intended effect without an audience, public acts of violence need spectators. According to criminologist John Horgan, who has studied terrorism for decades, it's a psychological warfare, pure psychological warfare. They don't just want to frighten us or get us to overreact. They want to be always in our consciousness, so that we believe there's nothing we won't do. It's a chain of decreasing responsibility, but all links are required. Say a terrorist does something harmful and films it with the specific aim of getting attention. They leak a video of it to the press, which go on to publish it. We as spectators then click on the link and watch the message. If a particular type of video goes particularly viral, those who created it learn that this is what works best. This is what gets our attention. So if they want our attention, they should do more of this. Even if this involves hijacking planes, driving trucks into crowds, or gruesome displays of power in conflict zones. Are you evil for watching things online? Probably not. But you are probably helping terrorists to achieve what many of them want, which is to get political message spread widely. I encourage you to be a conscious consumer of media reporting on terrorism, realizing that the larger impact that hiking up the number of views on a particular video might have in real life. Failing to prevent or discourage a harmful act might be almost as bad as directly committing the act itself. Directly related to this is a bystander effect. This line of research began as a response to the 1964 case of Kitty Jensoff. Over the course of half an hour, Genovus was stabbed to death outside her apartment building in New York. The press widely reported the murder, claiming that up to 38 witnesses heard or saw the attack, but none intervened to help her or called the police. This prompted the research for an explanation of what became known as the Genovese syndrome, or the bystander defect. The New York Times, the outlet that reported the story, was later accused of grossly exaggerating the number of witnesses and what they perceived. Still, the case led to an interesting question. Why do good people sometimes do nothing to stop evil acts? In the first research paper on the topic, social psychologists John Darley and Bibel Latine wrote, preachers, professors, and news commentators sought the reason of the such apparently conscienceless and inhumane lack of intervention. Their conclusions ranged from moral decay to dehumanization produced by the urban environment to alienation, anime, existential despair. But Darley and Latany didn't agree with these interpretations and argued that factors other than apathy and indifference were involved. If you had taken part in this seminal experiment, it would have gone down as follows. Knowing nothing about the nature of the study, you arrive in a long corridor with doors opening to either side of it, into a number of small rooms. A research assistant meets you and takes you into one of the rooms, seating you at a table, and you are given headphones and a microphone, and you are told to listen to the instructions. Through the headphones, you hear an experimenter explain that he is interested in learning about the personal problems faced by the university students. It's explained to you that the headphones are there to preserve your anonymity and you are going to be talking to other students. The researcher will listen to the tapes of your responses later, you are told, and because the researchers will not be present, all those involved will need to take turns. 
Each participant gets the microphone on for two minutes, and during that time, others cannot talk. You hear the other participants share their stories of adjusting to New York. You share yours. It's the first participant's turn again. He makes a few comments, but begin to grow louder and more incoherent. You hear, I, I think, I need if, if could somebody, uh, give me a little, give me a little help here, because I'm having a real problem right now, and I, if somebody could help me out, it would, it would be sure, it would be good, because there are, because I've, I've got one of these things coming, and, and I, I could really use some help if somebody would just give me some help, could somebody, could somebody help? Shocking sounds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. Help! And then other chocks, then quiet. It's his turn to talk. So you cannot ask the others if they have done anything. You are on your own. And you are being timed. The question is, how long will it take you to leave your research room to get help? Of those led to believe that the experiment only involved themselves and the person having the seizures, 85% went to get help before the end of the fit, and the average time it took to get help was 52 seconds. For those who saw that there was one additional participant, 62% held before the end of the fit, and it took them 93 seconds on average. For those who believed there were 6 participants in total, 31% got help before it was too late and it took them 166 seconds on average. Now. This situation was incredibly realistic. Can you imagine the ethics they had to clear for this? According to the researchers, subjects, whether or not they intervened, believed that the fit to be genuine and serious. Yet a number of participants still didn't report it, and it wasn't apathy. If anything, seemed more emotionally arose than did the subjects who reported the emergency. Instead, the researchers argued that their inaction had more to do with a sort of decision paralysis being stuck between two bad options, potentially overreacting and ruining the experiment or feeling guilty for not reacting. A couple of years later, in 1970, Latney and Darley proposed a five-step psychological model to explain this phenomenon better. They argued that in order to intervene, a bystander must number one, notice the critical situation, two, believe that the situation is an emergency, three, have a sense of personal responsibility, 4. Believe they have the skills needed to deal with the situation and 5. Make the decision to help. What stops us isn't a lack of caring, it's a combination of three psychological processes. The first is a diffusion of responsibility where we think that anyone in the group can help, so why should it have to be us? The second is evaluation apprehension, which is the fear of being judged by others when we act in public, the fear of embarrassment, particularly in a place like Breton. The third is pluralistic ignorance, the tendency to rely on the reactions of others when assessing the severity of a situation. If no one's helping, this means no help is needed. And the more bystanders they are, generally, the less likely we are to help a person who is in need. In 2011, Peter Fisher and Cleese reviewed 50 years worth of studies that included data from over 7,700 participants who took part in modified versions of the original experiment, some conducted in labs and some in the wild. Fifty years later, we are still affected by the number of bystanders. The more people that are around a crime scene and also not helping, the more likely we are to disregard distressed victims. But they also found that for physically dangerous emergencies where perpetrators were still present, people were higher likely to help even if there were many bystanders. Accordingly, they said, although the present meta-analysis showed that the presence of bystanders reducing helping responses, the picture is not as bleak as conventionally assumed. The finding that bystander inhibition is less pronounced, especially in dangerous emergencies, gives hope that we will receive help when help is really needed, even if there is more than one witness for our fight. Like in the Kitty Genovese case, bystanders have many understandable motivations to not get involved, but doing nothing can be almost as bad as doing something harmful. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you are watching something unfold that is harmful or potentially an emergency, take action. 
Do something to intervene or at least report it. Don't assume that others will do it for you as they might be thinking the same thing of you with potentially fatal consequences. In some countries, not reporting crime can be a crime in its own right. I think the sentiment behind mandatory reporting laws goes in the right direction. If you know that a crime is being committed, you aren't off the hook just because you are not the one committing it. Now, let's turn it around. When would you become the perpetrator, not just the bystander? How about perpetrating one of the most highly published and violent types of attacks? The wrong question. It's a question that comes up every time another terrorist attack is announced on TV. Why would anyone become a terrorist? The word itself has rather interesting history. It was first used in France in the late 18th century when terrorism described by the politically motivated violence carried out by the Jacobin government against its own people. This fled in 19th century Europe when it turned from violent intimidation committed by governments to violent intimidation directed towards government. Terrorism was rebranded and eventually gained the image we know today. Terrorism involves the use of terror and violence to intimidate and subjugate as a political weapon or policy. And while many definitions, including that of the US Department, limit terrorists to subnational groups or clandestine agents, many people take issue with this and highlight the need to be able to see states as agents of terrorism. And we know at least one thing for sure, people don't become terrorists simply because they are homicidal psychopaths. Even more broadly, there doesn't seem to be any particular kind of personality constellation that makes us more prone to becoming a terrorist. As summarized by psychologist Andrew Silk in 2003 in his book Terrorists, Victims and Society, quite simply, the best of the empirical work doesn't suggest and never has suggested that terrorists possess a distinct personality or that their psychology is somehow deviant from that of the normal people. In 2017, this sentiment was further echoed by Armando Pesemi and colleagues, who found that the popular opinion that terrorists must be insane or psychopathic is still widespread. However, no evidence exists that terrorist behavior may be caused either by prior or current psychiatric disorders or psychopathy. Moreover, most of these theories they don't explain why. Why do many people become terrorists, even if so many people are exposed to the same social factors or show the same psychological traits, only a tiny minority of them join a terrorist group? Terrorists may be portrayed as evil, but author and philosopher Alison Jagger, who has tried to find a better definition of terrorism, claims that they are likely to see themselves as warriors, fighting for a noble cause with the only means available to them. But who is part of the tiny minority of those who become terrorists? People like Amir. We don't know very much about Amir, but from what we do know, he was a pretty regular teenager living in Turkey. After high school, he went to college but dropped out. His parents were pressuring him to find a wife and a job and to straighten out his life when an easy solution seemed to appear. The terrorist group ISIS promised $50 per month along with a house and a wife. Amir crossed into Syria and signed up. When he spoke with NBC in 2015, an interviewer asked him, how could you join an organization like this? Amir broke down in tears and explained, my life was hard and nobody liked me. I didn't have many friends. I was on the internet a lot and playing games. He claimed that ISIS offered him a reprieve from all of this. He said that he was also shown videos that made it look amazing. Further, adding to the allure, but when things got real and Amir was in the field tasked with killing opponents, he surrendered after just three days of fighting. It turned out that he didn't feel able to kill and ISIS couldn't actually give him whatever it was he was looking for, which probably including a sense of belonging, friends, a higher purpose, financial stability and love. Most of us are not strangers to loneliness, or playing games online, or having nagging parents, yet we don't become ISIS fighters. So. What's different about Amir? It turns out we have no idea. Despite how much we talk about terrorism, we actually know very little about why individuals become terrorists. This explanation is deeply unsatisfying, which is probably why we almost never hear it. According to terrorism expert John Horgan, faced with what appears to be an unending series of terrorist events and equally invasive media coverage, 
A temptation for the seasoned pundit might be to offer a different, perhaps more honest answer. Actually, we don't really know why people become terrorists, or no, psychology cannot predict who is vulnerable to becoming a terrorist. But actually, this won't make us feel any more informed or confident than any terrorist attack. After any attack, we are looking for someone to give us clues regarding what to look for in individuals, and so we can gain control over the real sense of dread that comes with realizing that such an attack can happen anywhere to anyone. Yet our governments are happy to provide us with the illusion of control and useless advice. In 2018, the US Homeland Security gave us the trademarked phrase, if you see something, say something, which they ambiguously explain is when you see something you know shouldn't be there, or someone's behavior that doesn't seem quite right, it sounds a bit like a campaign for people who suddenly regain their sight. I see something. I see something. Taking a different approach, for the London Metropolitan Police in 2018, the signs of the possible terrorist activity mostly have to do with making bombs and planning an attack. They want to know, have you noticed someone buying large or unusual quantities of chemicals for no obvious reason? Well, do you know someone who travels but is vague about where they are going? Or my personal favorite, have you been someone who has several mobiles for no obvious reason? Presumably, these instructions are so vague because counter-terrorism units and police forces really have little idea what the public should be looking for. On top of that, particularly in big cities like London, with lots of weird people doing weird things all the time, even defining suspicious behavior becomes very difficult. It's therefore unsurprising that many counter-terrorism procedures have little evidence to support their efficacy. Back in 2006, Cynthia Lum and colleagues critiqued the literature on counter-terrorism. Not only we did discover an almost complete absence of evaluation research on counter-terrorism interventions, but from those evaluations that we could find, it appears that some interventions either didn't achieve the outcomes sought or sometimes increased the likelihood of terrorism occurring. This concern was echoed in a 2014 review of counter-terrorism by Rebecca Fries, who argued that we are still largely flying blind because counter-terrorism research has suffered from both a lack of sufficient trigger and lack of influence on policy making. Going forward, we must be very careful that our response to threat doesn't increase our risk of attack. Part of why the evidence base is lacking is because, unfortunately, compared to other types of crime, terrorism is such a rare event that it makes it very difficult to research and to predict. In addition to that, Terrorists can come from all walks of life. According to John Hogan, for every disenfranchised, angry young Muslim man who joins the so-called Islamic State, we can find examples of well-off, well-integrated young men and women who leave their current lives, jobs, partners or spouses behind them. Sometimes entire families join en masse. For every religious person that mobilizes to join, we find others either completely ignorant of any religious practice or knowledge and others gain who are recent converts. This isn't just true for ISIS, it's true of many terrorist organizations and even the so-called lone wolf terrorists don't fit neatly into any psychological profile. This is so much diversity and complexity and the relative paucity of data that asking who becomes a terrorist is probably the wrong question. Although we cannot say that who will become a terrorist, scholars do know a few things about the process of radicalization. One of the groups most associated with radicalization and terrorism today are jihadi terrorists. According to the BBC, jihadists see violent struggle as necessary to eradicate obstacles to restoring God's rule on earth and defending the Muslim community or ummah against infidels and upstates. Obstacles that must be eradicated can include Western ideologies and lifestyles. After reviewing the literature and honing into on jihadi terrorism, in 2017, psychologists Clark Mackley and Sophia Mosclano proposed that two pyramids model of radicalization. They argue that there are two aspects of radicalization that make it very difficult to understand. First, most people with extremist views never commit acts of terrorism. Second, 
Some terrorists don't have radical or violent beliefs. Because of this insufficient link between beliefs and actions in their model, Macaulay and Moskalink split radicalization of opinions from radicalization of actions. The first opinion pyramid looks like this. At the base are individuals who don't care about a political cause. Higher in the pyramid are those who believe in the cause but don't justify violence. Sympathizers. Higher yet are those who justify violence in defense of the cause. And we can put some numbers on the pyramid with the help of polling data. According to Mackay, over half of Muslims in the US and UK believe the war on terror to be a war on Islam. These are individuals who can sympathize with the cause. But only about 5% of Muslims in the US and UK see suicide bombings in defense of Islam as often or sometimes justified. These 5% are high on the belief pyramid. Our former ISIS fighter, Amir, also spoke about this. While his motivation seemed to be a more practical than ideological, finally, a wife. The normalization and justification of radical beliefs and behaviors was evidenced by his ISIS training. Nobody likes anyone to be killed without reason, he said. According to Amir, ISIS leaders justified their beheadings by saying it was necessary to instill fear and ensure that people run away from us. The killing of homosexuals by throwing them off tall buildings was justified because they were half men like women. With regard to killing women more generally, this was justified by saying that all women killed were adulterers, so during training, ISIS was actively radicalizing their recruits and giving them justifications for extreme violence. But being high on the belief pyramid is not itself enough to be a terrorist, which is probably one reason why Amir quit on day three. He just didn't really have it in him to kill, referred to as a common push factor that contributes to terrorists disengaging from their organizations is the inability to cope with the psychological effects of violence, and thus an ability to follow through with terrorist behavior. To become a terrorist and stay a terrorist, one must be also high on the action pyramid. Macaulay and Moskalenko explained that the action pyramid thus, at the base of this pyramid, are individuals doing nothing for a political group or cause. Inert. Higher in the pyramid are those who are engaged in legal political action for the cause. Activists. Higher yet are those engaged in illegal action for the cause. Radicals. And at the apex of the pyramid are those engaged in illegal action that target civilians. Terrorists. Terrorists don't just need to adhere to an ideology. They must also adhere to behavioral protocol. So what do we do with this information? For one, we stop assuming that individuals simply commit jihadist terrorist activities because they have made a rational choice to gain access to a rewarding afterlife. We must also dismiss the assumption that terrorists are evil psychopaths who will stop at nothing to do us harm. Instead, we should examine the often incremental shift towards more radical beliefs and an acceptance of violence and crime, the same process that is associated with other many kinds of wrongdoing, the process that could potentially make any one of us terrorist. Let's explore the idea further, what could make us cruel and the terrorist into victims, the Lucifer effect. Many of us seem to find it quite easy to justify the torture of actual or potential terrorists. This is despite the legal, ethical and moral sanctions against it. And according to a psychologist, Lawrence Alson and Emily Alson, the lack of evidence for its efficacy, after reviewing the evidence on torture, they conclude that it's mostly used as punishment and usually doesn't give us reliable information. According to their work, Revenge-motivated interrogations regularly occur in high-conflict, high-uncertainty situations and where there's dehumanization of the enemy. During the war and terror, the former Iraqi prison Abu Ghraib was made into a military prison by the Western allies. In 2003 and 2004, stories and documentary evidence came to light showing that human rights violations were happening at the prison, including torture, physical and sexual abuse, rape and murder. 
The crimes were perpetrated by the military staff and many were documented. For some odd reason, the perpetrators had taken over 1,000 photos of their mess, photos of naked, hooded, dirty prisoners forced to perform oral sex on one another or stacked on one another in a human pyramid or being punched or injected with substance. In a number of the photos of the military staff were visible, sitting on the prisoners with their thumbs up or smiling. When these photos leaked, the big question was, what the hell was that? Social psychologist Philip Zimbardo became an expert witness for one of the Abu Ghraib guards, giving him access not just to one of the perpetrators, but to the photos taken during crimes. What he referred to was the visual illustrations of evil, but he didn't think that these people were inherently evil, that they were just a bunch of bad apples. No, he found that the system creates the situation that corrupts the individuals, and he should know, because he conducted one of the most famous experiments of all time on the ability of a situation to corrupt normal people, Philip Zimbardo has spent most of his career researching the social and structural influences that explain how good people turn evil, or as he has called it, the Lucifer effect. His most famous experiment, indeed, one of the most famous psychological experiments of all time, had an inspecious title, Interpersonal Dynamics, a Simulated Prison. More commonly, it's referred to as a Stanford Prison Experiment. Published in 1973 with Craig Haney and Curtis Banks, the study revolutionized how we think about the social influences on behavior. Although it has been criticized repeatedly most recently in a long and very public bashing in 2018, the study will always be relevant. In the original paper, the team write that a normal group of male college students, yes, yet another study with an all-male participant pool, this was very popular until quite recently, partially because being female was seen as confound. What the hell? Right. Anyways, were chosen after extensive testing, for a psychological study of prison life in return for payment of $15 per day. 21 men were selected, of which 10 were randomly assigned to play the role of prisoners and 11 to be their guards. The prisoners were told to be home on a specific Sunday where they were to receive a call and the experiment would begin. Instead of a phone call, however, participants were unexpectedly arrested by a real police officer who charged them with a crime handcuffed them and drove them to police station. After having them fingerprints and mugshots taken, they were blindfolded and taken to a mock prison, where they were stripped, sprayed, and made to stand alone naked. They were then dressed in uniforms, assigned numbers, and taken to their cells, where they were supposed to spend the next two weeks. In the paper, the prison is described as follows. It was built on a 35 feet section, of a basement corridor in the psychology building at Stanford University, three small cells were made from converted laboratory rooms by replacing the usual doors with steel-barred, black-painted ones and removing all furniture, a cot with mattress, sheet and pillow, for each prisoner was the only furniture in the cells, a small closet served as a solitary confinement facility, its dimensions were extremely and very small, 2 times 2 times 7 feet, the prison guards had a very different experience. They received their instruction the day before meeting the prisoners, where they were introduced to Zimbabwe, the superintendent of the prison and a research assistant who assumed the role of prison warden. The guards were told that their job was to maintain a reasonable degree of order within the prisons necessary for its effective functioning, and that they would give the prisoners their meals, work, and recreation. They received little other instruction as to what to do, other than being told that physical punishment or aggression was explicitly and categorically prohibited, and that they should refer to the prisoners by their badge number, unlike the prisoners, guards had eight four shifts and got to go home in between. During their shifts, the guards had their own quarters, which had a recreation room. Now, picture yourself in this position. How do you think he would perform as an impromptu guard? It seems like a simple situation, one in which it's easy to stay respectful and considerate of each other, particularly since you know researchers are watching your every move, but as you probably already know or expect, that's not how it went down. Mood plummeted rapidly, as did general outlook. Only a few hours after being assigned to their roles, the guards began to harass the prisoners. 
At 2.30 in the morning, prisoners were awoken with whistles and later prisoners were insulted and given ridiculous orders. Already on day two, there was an uprising by the prisoners against their treatment by the guards, with the prisoners barricading themselves into their cells. The guards, in an effort to restore order, broke down the barricades to punish the prisoners for their behavior. They then stripped them of their clothing, put bags over their heads and made them do push-ups and other humiliating exercises. The leader of the uprising was then locked into isolation for many hours. Prisoners started to have emotional meltdowns and one refused to eat. The experiment had to end early after just six days rather than the planned 14 days. According to the original write-up, we witnessed a sample of normal, healthy American college students fractionate into a group of prison guards who seemed to derive pleasure from insulting, threatening, humiliating, and dehumanizing their peers. Those who by chance selection had been assigned to the prisoner role. Most dramatic and distressing to us was the observation of the ease with sadistic behavior could be elicited in individuals who were not sadistic types. Over the six days that the experiment took place, the guards engaged in escalating levels of harassment and verbal aggression. Statements taken from them after the end of the experiment showed how they quickly came to dehumanize the prisoners. Looking back, I am impressed by how little I felt for them. I watched them tear at each other on orders given by us. We were always there to show them just who was the boss. The guards justified their aggression as just playing a role, although the reactions of the prisoners, including emotional breakdowns, were all too real, according to the prisoners. The way we were made to degrade ourselves really brought us down, and that's why we all sat toward the end of the experiment. I began to feel I was losing my identity, that the person I call, the person who volunteered to get me into this prison, because it was a prison to me, it's still a prison to me, I don't regard it as an experiment or simulation, was distant from me, was removed until, finally, I wasn't that person. I was 416. I was really my number, and 416 was really going to have to decide what to do. I learned that people can easily forget that others are human. Why did this escalate, and why didn't the participants just walk out of the study? Zimbardo argues that one of the main processes that led to this degrading environment was de-individualization, partially caused by uniforms, guards, and prisoners, who were made to feel like distinct groups, but not as distinct individuals within those groups. De-individualization is the loss of self-awareness when we identify as part of a group. Once one of the guards, who was referred to as John Wayne, after the actor started to misbehave, the whole group of guards was affected and began to see this as acceptable behavior. Similarly, once a prisoner accepted the loss of control and behaved passively, the group began to act in ever more passive ways. According to Zimbabwe, the seven social processes that graze the slippery slope of evil are number 1. Mindlessly taking the first small step 2. Dehumanization of others 3. De-individuation of self 4. Diffusion of personal responsibility 5. Blind obedience to authority 6. Uncritical conformity to group norms and 7. Passive tolerance of evil through inaction or indifference Now, similar to our terrorism pyramids, what is needed here is an incremental shift in opinions justifying increasing levels of aggressions as necessary to maintain control, an incremental shift in action, actually perpetrating increasing levels of aggression. Although the ethics of the study have been heavily criticized, including by Zimbardo himself, and the interpretations of the findings have been challenged in various ways, including by psychologists, journalists, and even the participants themselves, the conclusions have nonetheless had a tremendous impact on how we view aggressive behavior within and between groups. As Zimbardo states, while describing his own work and the work of Stanley Milgram's obedience study, evil acts are not necessarily the deeds of evil men, but may be attributable to the operation of powerful social forces. I think that understanding the social forces that influence us all helps us both in terms of understanding and empathizing. 
with those who are corrupted by and within organizations and it can help us better protect ourselves from their influence. Knowledge is power and knowing how easily we slip into bad behavior encouraged by the groups we function in can help us spot and stop our own radicalization. The slope may be slippery, but we need to remember that we can probably get off at any point. Problems of conscience. This brings us back to whether this chapter started the Nazis. Adolf Eschmann was put on trial in 1961 for his leading role in the Holocaust, including coordinating mass deportations to the ghettos and extermination camps. As the presiding judge stated during his sentencing, Eschmann's crimes are out of unparalleled horror in their nature and their scope. The philosopher Hannah Arndt, who perhaps ironically was a racist herself, reported on Eschmann's trial at the time in a series of articles in The New Yorker, then in her popular 1963 book Eschmann in Jerusalem, and she summarizes the unfolding of the trial and gives absolute observations, trying throughout to make sense of the man behind the horror. Although the prosecution tried to make out that Eshman was a perverted sadist and a monster, what they found was an average man, who appeared to be more often concerned with how to get his job done rather than whether or how it was done. And it depresses Eshman as man concerned more with timetables and travel costs than the realities of sufferings he was inflicting. The problem with Eshman was precisely that so many were like him, terribly and terrifyingly normal. Nazis, including Eshman, often normalized the propaganda that was sold to them, and many stopped thinking for themselves. According to Arndt, what stuck in the minds of these men who became murderers was simply the notion of being involved in something historic, grandiose, unique, which must therefore be difficult to bear. This was important. Because simply, the murderers were not sadists or killers by nature. They believed that they were working towards a noble, greater good, and that the deaths and devastation they were carrying out was a temporary burden they had to endure. But this was easier said than done. Humans are naturally programmed to respond to human suffering with pity, with sadness, with guilt. All of these emotions serve to inhibit us from hurting each other. So high-ranking Nazis who believed in their cause helped individuals overcome their problems of conscience. Arndt explains, the trick consisted in turning these instincts around, as it were, in directing them towards the self. So that instead of saying what horrible things I did to people, the murderers would be able to say what horrible things I had to watch in the pursuance of my duties, how heavy the task weighted upon my shoulders. Germans were told to feel that they were the ones suffering, that they were the ones sacrificing themselves. In this flipped reality, not killing people becomes deviant, the selfish thing to do. To ease one's own conscience was to sacrifice a greater good. Such circumstances make it difficult to know or to feel that one is doing wrong. Yet can we excuse Eshman for being the product of the times, for believing that the final solution was best course of action, and for playing a deciding role in making it a reality? I believe not. The presiding judge at Eshman's trial didn't buy the argument that he was just following orders, even if we had found that the accused acted out of blind obedience, as he argued, we would still have said that a man who took part in crimes of such magnitude at these over years must pay the maximum penalty known to the law, and he cannot rely on any order even in mitigation of his punishment. The judge made it clear that blind obedience isn't an excuse, not even a partial excuse, for causing such extreme suffering. This is in line with current laws that state that soldiers are not allowed to follow unlawful orders and cannot simply claim that they were following orders as an excuse for wrongdoing. In the end, Eshman was sentenced to death by hanging for the crimes against the Jewish people, the crimes against humanity and the war crime of which he has been found guilty. This issue isn't about a particular human being. It's not just about Eshman, as Arndt writes, ultimately the entire human race sits invisibly behind the defendant in the dock. The story of a normal person being at least partially responsible for the deaths of six million people is a tale of caution for all of us. 
a sign that kinds of mechanism I have explored in this chapter can compound, can escalate, and can lure us into causing an almost unthinkable magnitude of harm. Throughout this chapter, I've tried to explain how social situations can influence human behavior, bringing out the worst in us. I've tried to explain why we all might find ourselves compelled to think in ways that other members of our group think, to act in line with how our group acts, but to explain is not the same as to excuse. Just because we can see how circumstances influence us in profound ways doesn't mean that we are justified in behaving badly. I would argue the exact opposite. Arndt argues that evil is banal, and scholars like Zimbardo and Mergram argue that we are all capable of evil, given the right circumstances. I go further and suggest that the fact that it's so commonplace detracts from the integrity of the concept of we are all evil, are all capable of evil, does the word even still hold the meaning it's intended to have? If evil isn't reserved for the worst possible or problem, what then its purpose? I challenge you to go through life without restoring to calling actions or people evil. Instead, to truly try to break down human atrocities and the people who commit them into their individual parts. Examine each part carefully like a detective. You are looking for clues as to why it happened and perhaps what useful information you can glean that might help you prevent it from happening in the future. Now that we understand some of the factors that influence wrongdoers, we carry even more responsibility to behave in line with our morality by understanding concepts such as group pressure, bystander effects, authority, and de-individuation. We carry the responsibility to fight these social pressures when they try to lure us in immoral behavior. Be cautious, be delegant, be strong, because any suffering you cause directly or indirectly is on you. Whether you look at Hitler or the Nazis, at rapists or rape culture, at terrorist or radical belief systems, we can see how individuals are influenced by a combination of their brains, their dispositions, and their social systems they live in. Throughout this book, we have alternated between exploring situations, thoughts, and concepts that are extreme and those that regularly touch our lives. We have wandered in and out of topics that many would normally don't dare engage with them, and you have probably felt yourself at times getting uncomfortable, disconcerted, and angry. I know I have. Some sections of this book were very difficult to write, so I imagine they were difficult to read. I needed to step away from the material sometimes, let it digest, Perhaps you did the same. I needed to remind myself that these thought experiments help us grow as human beings, that by understanding each other and ourselves, we move forward as a society. So what do we do now? Now is the time for action. Now the discussion about evil can really begin. And this concludes the last part of Making Evil, Part 8.